Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain and I'm here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain. This time we're excited to bring you the highlights from the ESMO 2024 focused on breast cancer. Thousands of abstracts were presented here, but we've picked three key studies that can impact our current practice in the community. To guide us through this data, we're thrilled to have none other than Dr. Paolo Tarantino from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Paolo, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Rahul. Hello, Rohit. Such a pleasure to join you and discuss this abstract. Well, thanks, Samish, for joining us from Italy, Paolo. Another exciting ESMO in the books here. Uh, we'll start off with focusing on three important abstracts from ESMO 2024 in breast cancer space. First of all, Natalie trial, we mainly updated results, which recently just got FDA approved based on off this study as well. Then we'll dive into another standard of care practice, which is Keynote 522 perioperative pembrolizumab approach in triple negative breast cancer. And lastly, we'll touch on intracranial activity of TDXD based on Destiny Breast 12 study. Let's start off the first one, Natalie trial. Before we dive into any further, let's talk a bit about the study design. It is slightly different than Monarch E, which was based on uh, a bemocyclib in adjuvant setting. So absolutely. Just like Monarchy, this was a phase three trial, um, basically trying to show if utilizing a CDK46 inhibitor in the adjuvant setting rather than in the metastatic setting, we could actually prevent some recurrences, improve outcomes in patients with early stage, non-metastatic or more receptor positive to negative breast cancer. And But differently from Monarchy, Natalie included a different agent, of course, ribocyclib combined with an aromatase inhibitor, whereas in monarchy, you could have either an aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen. Natalie included a much broader population because monarchy was restricted to not positive patients, whereas in Natalie, you have both patients with not positive disease or also high risk, not negative disease. High risk defined as grade three or grade two and a high evidence of high risk based on Ki67 or Oncotype DX. And interestingly, the, the dose that was chosen for Natalie of ribocyclib is lower than the one that use, is utilized in the metastatic setting, most likely to, to reduce the, the risk of side effects with adjuvant ribocyclib. Finally, I will mention one, one important difference. Um, Monarchy utilized adjuvant abemocyclib for two years, whereas in Natalie, adjuvant ribocyclib is given for three years. So all, all in that, basically, Natalie was assessing if three years of a reduced dose of ribocyclib added to an aromatase inhibitor can improve outcomes in patients with ear positive to negative breast cancer, with the primary endpoint being invasive disease-free survival. Paulo, thank you so much for laying that foundation, because now we do have these two drugs available. Rohit, you mentioned ribocyclib was literally approved days after the data was presented at ESMO 2024, where we saw improved invasive disease-free survival. Paulo, can you walk us through what do we see at that four-year mark? And importantly, what does it really mean for our patients? Are you going to offer this to all your patients that are node negative? What about the patients that qualify for both ribo and abema if you have node positive disease? Absolutely. It was so interesting to see such a, a fast approval. Well, expected somewhat because the data that we saw at ESMO was very nice. And in truth, we knew already that statistically, adjuvant ribocyclib improved invasive disease-free survival. But at this update of the data after four, after, yeah, four years, basically what we wanted to see is if there is a carryover effect after all of the patients had discontinued adjuvant ribo. And that's the case because at this update, all the patients that either completed or discontinued adjuvant ribocyclib. And also we wanted to see what was the delta of benefit in patients that received ribo compared to those that did not receive ribo. And basically we saw that at four years, there was a delta of about 5% in invasive disease-free survival. So what you see that at four years, 88.5% uh, per, of the patients that received RIBO compared to only 83.6% that did not receive RIBO were free from a, mostly a recurrence. The IDFS event includes other events, but these were mostly recurrences. And when we looked at distant disease-free survival, you see that most of these were distant recurrences, metastatic recurrences. And, and so we know that preventing those can really have an impact on patients' survival. And, and, and this is why we expect that this 5% delta 
in invasive disease-free survival, very similar data in disease, distant disease-free survival, will in the long run translate in more patients being cured from their disease and having improved survival. But in order to, to see an overall survival advantage, we have to wait a very long time. And this is why the FDA has approved this drug, and I think it makes sense to utilize this drug in clinical practice. Although, of course, as you mentioned, there are two drugs now approved in this setting. And it should have been a cyclic, the Monarchy trial as a longer follow-up has got more years after, of follow-up after all patients have discontinued the drug. And so I personally tend to feel to prefer the use of abemacyclib in patients that have overlapping indication, although ribocyclib has a different toxicity profile and can be also be considered. But for patients with high-risk, not negative disease, I do feel that considering ribocyclib is, is, of course, a good option, whereas abemacyclib was never tested in non-negative patients. So I would only consider ribocyclib in those patients, it does, of course, remain a, an agent with some risk of side effects. We know there are some uh, hepatotoxicity is a risk of side effect, and also you can have cardiac toxicity in about 5% of the patients. And, and also, on the long run, we know they can also have financial toxicities. And so it's important to, to discuss this important data, but also to, to uh, understand all of these potential risks and always calculate the risk-benefit ratio and, and, and make also a shared decision-making with the patient when you decide about adjuvant CDKs. Exciting times with two FDA-approved options now in adjuvant setting, bemocyclib and ribocyclib. As you stated, ribocyclib, slightly broader inclusion criteria there in comparison to abema. Abema, in general, has more mature data. Important to address that three years versus two years distinction as well. Now, moving on to another standard of care practice that we have been utilizing based off of Keynote 522 in triple negative breast cancer settings. Similar has been seen in lung cancer space where we have been utilizing perioperative uh, immunotherapy and recently at ESMO 2024 at presidential debate, Dr. Powell's presented Niagara study, which is with Duralma perioperative and bladder setting. At ESMO 2024, focusing on Keynote 522, we did see overall survival results. Before we discuss, it is important to acknowledge that this regimen is generally toxic. Paolo, there are different ways to administer this. How do you go about administering? I know AC can be given first or even carboplatin weekly versus three weeks. How do you go about administering this regimen? So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with everything that you said, meaning that, you know, the Keynote 522, we tend to call it this way just because there's so many drugs in it that if you want to call all of them, it, it takes a long time. You know, <laughs> this includes four chemotherapy drugs plus an immunotherapy drug. And it's an intense regimen. And whenever you start this regimen, you may expect, you should expect side effects. Also, some we, we saw some real world data showing that hospitalizations are not too infrequent in this case. But after showing the benefit of this regimen, we just know how important it is and how it can really save lives. And so it's important to administer it in, in the right way. And there is no single right way because there is, for instance, uh, the, as you mentioned, the sequencing. You can decide to start with antracyclines or carboplatin paclitaxel. Usually I start with carboplatin paclitaxel like in the study. And also you can decide, decide if to administer the antracyclines in a dose-dense fashion or non-dose-dense fashion. In the trial, this was not done, the dose dense administration, but we know that there is trials, there is large meta-analysis suggesting a benefit for dose dense. So I think either are reasonable. At Dana Farber, we tend to prefer the dose dense, which creates some difficulties with matching it with the Pembrane infusions. But in the end, all of this still is feasible and, and makes sense. The most important thing to remember is that when you add an immunotherapy drug, especially when you add it upon all of these chemotherapy drugs, you may expect immunotherapy-related side effects. Immune-related side effects, it's important to recognize them and to stop immunotherapy and to give steroids whenever this happens and, of course, stick to the guidelines. But with that said, once again, we realize of how important this regimen is, and not only in patients with not positive triple negative disease, but we even saw data dissected for patients with T2 and 0 triple negative breast cancer, there is a large population and there was a major benefit in that population. So most of the patients with early stage triple negative breast cancer nowadays qualify for this regimen. And it's important that the, the curve of learning of how to administer it is very important because it, once again, it can save lives. Absolutely. And 
to be honest, when it comes to immunotherapy as a generalist or community oncologist, this is not just breast cancer. Roy had mentioned we're seeing this across different disease sites. And Paula, you mentioned dose dense AC. There are times when I'm using that, I tend to switch my Pembro to every six weeks as well to see if I can line that up uh, right. But coming back to the toxicity, we saw that the rate of discontinuation of this combination, even in the trial, was close to 20 to 25 percent. So in the real world analysis, if anything, it's a little higher, not less than that. But the reason for us to give this toxic, tough regimen, Paulo, you touched on it, is because it is saving lives. Initially, we were seeing increased pathological complete response. But thankfully, this has translated in an overall survival benefit. So, Paula, what did we see at ESMO 2024 for this study? So, what did we know before ESMO? We knew that the addition of Pembro to neoadjuvant chemo and continuation of Pembro after surgery was associated with a relevant improvement in event-free survival. And that relevant improvement now with longer follow-up, a medium follow-up of 75 months, was further reinforced. What we see is that now we have a 9% delta in event-free survival at five years with a hazard ratio of 0.65. And also, most importantly, we saw that there is an improvement in overall survival. There is a delta of 5% in overall survival at five years, which means really we are not only preventing these recurrences, but once again, even improving long-term survival with very similar hazard ratio between event-free survival and overall survival. Basically, we are reducing by one-third risk of recurrence we are reducing by one third the risk of death, which is very striking. And as we had seen previously with event-free survival, then there was this nice dissection of outcomes based on achievement of pathologic complete response or not at surgery. And what we saw is that the other ratio was quite similar among patients with pit cr non pat cr but we know that patients that achieve pathologic complete response a very low risk of recurrence, about 5%, even just with chemotherapy. And so most of the benefit with immunotherapy, we see it in patients with residual disease at surgery. But in truth, we know that we, we, we cannot make, it's very hard to make this prediction ahead before starting neoadjuvant treatment because you never, you're never going to know at that point if the patient is going to respond or not. And so right now, I feel that it's still reasonable to utilize chemoimmunotherapy in all of these patients up front. But I do hope in the, that in the future, we're going to get better at predicting which patients may just receive chemotherapy and which patients really require the addition of pembrolizumab or, or immunotherapy in general. And for that, we're really awaiting for more translational biomarker data from Keynote 522. And I do hope that in the future, we're gonna see those data in some upcoming Congress. Absolutely. Right. And as you stated, Paolo, that the role of pembrolizumab in adjuvant setting with when you actually receive PAT-CR is questionable. Yes, we are utilizing it, but we will find out how the trials play out in near future. Now, focusing on HER2 positive space, which is trastuzumab deruxtecan, the talk of the town, it also has intracranial activity. Paolo, can you please touch on the study design and its findings here, please? So um, I really feel that TDXD, the, the introduction of TDXD has changed the way we treat breast cancer and many other cancer types. This drug is really incredibly active. And I think one of the major perks of this drug is its intracranial activity. We had sensed this in breast oncology from several small trials. The Tuxedo trial, the Deborah trial, Rosette, and many other either studies or real-world experiences. But in truth, we still didn't have a large prospective trials showing the intracranial activity of TDXD. Now, finally, we do have one. And this trial was a Destiny Breast 12 that was presented by Nancy Lin at, uh, at ESMO in Barcelona and concomitantly published on Nature Medicine. And basically, this was a post-approval trial, a phase 3B4 trial, looking at TDXD among patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, either with brain metastasis or without. There were two cohorts. Patients needed to receive less than two lines of prior therapy in the metastatic setting. And most of the patients, 50% of them had received one prior line, but 40% two prior lines. So, so this was a second, third line trial utilizing TDXD for her to positive metastatic breast cancer. And, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival among patients with baseline brain metastasis or response rate in patients without brain metastasis. And, and I do feel that the results 
from this trial were striking because among patients with baseline brain metastasis, we saw that more than half after one year from starting TDXT were free from recurrence. The median PFS was 17.3 months. Once again, so striking. This We're talking here basically of a, a one year and a half of disease control in patients with very high risk disease, brain metastasis at baseline. And when you look also at overall survival among these patients, it was basically superimposable between patients with baseline brain mets or not, no brain mets. Really thinking that the this drug, we can change the, the trajectory of patients with brain mets closer to those without brain mets. And finally, the response rate of TDXC in this intracranial response rate was 70%. This is so, so, so exciting. And importantly, it's so good to see more and more clinical trials, including our patients with brain mets. Paulo, now we have data from tecatinib-based regimens, be it with TDM1 or capecitabine and trastuzumab. After destiny, breast 12. If no contraindications to either of these regimens, what's going to be your preferred second line option with or without brain mats? And I ran a poll and I found that basically Twitter kind of thinks like me, meaning that looking at this data, you cannot help but think that TDXC further reinforced its role in second line for her to positive disease. And so in the wide majority of the cases of patients with or without brain metastasis, I think trastuzumab deruxtecan would make the most reasonable choice in the second line. And in the future, we'll see based on Destiny Breast 09, if also in the first line. And I will mention that this data also reinforce, of course, this trial was only for patients with her two positive metastasis breast yes. cancer, but we know that TDXC is also approved for her to low metastatic breast cancer, and there may be an approval soon for her to ultra low, her to zero with minimal, her to staining. We have some data from some trials, from the DAISY trial, the DEBRA trial, showing intracranial activity also in patients with her to low disease, and it totally makes sense. The response rate seems to be, even in her to low disease, very similar in patients with or without brain meds. And so I feel that we're feeling more and more confident of utilizing this drug irrespective of HER2 status and irrespective of the presence or absence of brain metastasis. Uh, Dr. Tarantino, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts around these key abstracts from ESMO 2024. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In this discussion, we've covered three breast cancer studies with Dr. Paolo Tarantino that were presented at ESMO 2024. Starting off with the Natalie trial, which showed that adding ribocyclib to endocrine therapy improved invasive disease-free survival including in node-negative patients. But this comes at a cost of added side effects of ribocyclib for three years. Ribocyclib was approved on September 17, 2024 for this indication. Then we also had a chance to touch on Keynote 522, an update demonstrating overall survival benefit with periop pembrolizumab and neoadjuvant chemotherapy in early stage triple negative breast cancer. This continues to remain our current standard of care. Finally, the Destiny Breast 12 showed promising intracranial activity with trastuzumab deruxtecan in HER2 positive breast cancer patients with brain metastases. These studies continue to refine our approach to breast cancer treatment, offering new options and hope for our patients. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to check out our GI, Long, and GU ASMO conference highlights and discussions around the current standard of care. We are the Oncology Brothers.